Hi everybody, uh, thank you for joining us today on the US Market Outlook 2021 uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Tim from Prosperous, so I'm head of content at Prosperous. And um, before I kind of launch into introducing our guests, I kind of wanted to obviously uh, cover the disclaimer, which should be familiar with everybody. You know, this is not personalized financial advice. Um, you know, this is uh, purely everyone's personal opinion. So. Uh, please take it uh, in that vein when you do uh, when you do listen to us. Um, so before I get to the guests, I kind of wanted to share with everybody um, on the product that I'm working on, the product that I'm from, actually. So I'm I'm working as head of content for Prosperous, which is a new um, a new trading platform by CGS CIMB uh, for Singapore. Um, you know, you can invest on the go. It's a multi asset platform. So we have uh, you know an app. You can obviously uh, download it um, on Android and iOS. Uh, you have a boost and build platform, so you can either be more trading oriented if you feel like that's your style, or you can think about building out your portfolio over the long term. Um, and the great thing about it is we have multi multiple markets, um, multiple assets, multi-asset as well, um, a really good uh, fund range as well if you're interested in mutual funds. And Obviously, on the content side, where I head up, um, there's a lot of educational content, a lot of webinars, a lot of stock ideas as well for uh, US, Singapore, and Hong Kong markets. Um, so check us out. Um, we do have a promotion at the moment where you can experience life while investing. It's all about uh, enjoying you know, curate, curated experiences 
Um, for example, we have a gin or martini tasting at Atlas Bar, which is uh, which is cool. Uh, we also have you know some spin classes, some wheel throwing, um, some salt baths. So there's a whole mixture of uh, experiences that you can that you can win. So uh, be sure to check that out as well. Um, as part of our educational series, uh, we're also doing something on uh, we're also doing something on understanding risk and uh, volatility and portfolios. So it would be great to, uh, if you would like to sign up, just use the QR code. We'll be doing that next Thursday. We'll be having Jake uh, as a guest along with myself. Um, he's a portfolio manager at, uh, at the private wealth team at CGSCIMB Security. So he'll be giving his thoughts on um, understanding risk and uh, volatility and how to deal with that when you're building out your own portfolio. Um, beyond that, we have a few other, uh, we have a few other running sessions as well. So we have one on uh, SREITs, which I think everyone you know, in Singapore will probably be uh, familiar with. Uh, so if you can just, um, yeah, uh, gain, uh, oh, sorry, I don't know what's happened to that, but anyway, okay. That was, uh, yeah, if that's on the 16th of September. So we're gonna be doing that um, next month. Okay, so before I move on, I'll just, um, touch on the CGSC IMB Driven campaign. Uh, we're giving away a Tesla if you can trade with Prosperous or you can trade with CGSC IMB. So it's an opportunity to win a Tesla car who doesn't like a Tesla, uh, as well as multiple Apple products. So if you can trade from now up until the 31st of December, there's the opportunity to, uh, to win a Tesla car. So that's not a bad opportunity. Um, and with that, I think we can play the video here quickly. Okay, um, great. So before I launch into, um, before I launch into um, to the topics, I think I should introduce first the speakers. So first up we have um, uh, Jeremy, who is the market strategist an analyst at CGSC IMB Securities in Singapore. Um, he's been in the financial markets for more than 10 years, and he focuses on global markets as well as spotting long-term trends. And he employs TA, which is obviously technical analysis, to time uh, market entries and exits. So uh, he's gonna be first up to introduce um, his ideas for you know, daily trading ideas in the US and Singapore equity markets. Um, second, we have Bertram, who has a very uh, sort of Listening career in the securities industry um, in Hong Kong. He's been in research for over 20 years. He's our group head of research and also more recently has been appointed the group head of ESG. So he has a passion for business and the good that it can do in this world. Um, and he's going to be sharing some of his thoughts um, around the US market as well. And then finally, we have uh, Say Boon, who's joining us from Melbourne. So big shout out to him because it's a bit late there. Um, he's our chief investment strategist, uh, you know, over his 40 year career, he's worked in financial media, banking, finance, uh, and among other things, he's also served as, uh, the chief investment officer for DBS and chief investment strategist for standard chartered. Um, he has lots of passions, markets and martial arts, uh, among them. So without further ado, I'll, uh, pass it over to Jeremy to, uh, to give his, his thoughts on the U S market, Jeremy. All right, thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, very good evening to everyone and thanks for the kind introduction. 
So for today, uh, I guess the agenda for everyone will be looking at the US market and being one of the kind of a best performer in terms of uh, comparing from a global scale, I think uh, it does look interesting how uh, and where we stand right now in terms of looking at the uh, overall economic uh, standpoint. And as you can see over here, looking at the title, uh, mainly we are still looking at this particular economic expansion cycle being in the very early phase. And uh, clearly we still believe this uh, bull market is only in the early phase and we still have probably further room to grow especially talking about long-term growth here uh, that could actually last to 2024, 2025. So I will kind of lay my case here today in terms of why we see that long-term growth playing out uh, and not really nearing an end of a bull market, uh, but actually only at the very start of it. Uh, key agenda, I'll run through very quickly, just about 10 to 15 minutes, and then hopefully after which we'll jump to the Q&A. Uh, but mainly I think the key topic that we'll be covering here, will be looking at the current scale of this uh, economic uh, recovery. Uh, mainly the V-shaped recovery since the pandemic uh, low of last year in March. I think we have seen quite a strong growth since then. And looking at the current trajectory, I think it still looks rather healthy here. And uh, we still think that this has further room to grow, which I'll uh, kind of a supplement with some of the interesting charts as well as the data that I think will be pretty fruitful. And I think at the end of the day, I think right now the key thing is uh, with this vaccine uh, still rolling out uh, as per plan, uh, with US, I think, reaching uh, fully VEX 50% of the population, uh, first dose of VEX uh, rate being at 60%, I think all in still tells us that eventually we'll head into further reopening, uh, which would then again feed back to a stronger economic growth that will likely feed back into a higher kind of a earnings uh, in terms of uh, what the corporates are seeing. And that will likely feed through to, uh, I think, the bull market actually catching up uh, to the upside uh, moving forward. So I think firstly, I will usually start off with a long-term view in terms of where the overall economic landscape is, uh, mainly looking at the current cycle where we are in purely just looking at the GDP expansion as well as the recession cycle. So over here, we have quite a bit of things going on, but uh, just to lay out what I'm showing here, basically uh, looking at the GDP data going all the way back to 1933. So we have quite a bit of ample data here in terms of uh, tracking how the expansion cycle as well as the recession cycle plays out. And uh, clearly looking at the overall average uh, for both expansion as well as the recession cycle, you can see here this column here, uh, tabulate the average length of the economic expansion. And uh, on average, each economic expansion lasts for at least around five years or more before we actually slip back into a recession. Uh, and where a recession usually lasts for around uh, 12 months or so before we actually turn back into an expansion cycle. So clearly with that in mind, a uh, key question here right now is where we are in this uh, economic expansion cycle. Are we near the end of an uh, expansion? Are we in the early phase of a bear market? Uh, and clearly right now, I think looking at where we have been through from the COVID pandemic lockdown of last year, where we actually saw a recession kicking in uh, in Q1 uh, 2020. Uh, key thing that has actually changed since then is uh, the V-shaped recovery from the reopening since the lockdown in uh, March and April. Uh, the GDP data actually suggests to us that we have right now uh, actually moved back into the expansion cycle since uh, Q3 of last year. And uh, right now we can see we are in the first year kind of an anniversary in terms of uh, this economic expansion where we've actually seen four consecutive quarters of expansion playing out already since Q3 of last year. So which means again right now we are only in this early, pretty early phase of this expansion cycle. Again, like I mentioned, uh, you can see historically, it usually lasts around five years or so uh, for this expansion cycle to play out before we actually slip into a recession. So right now, with us actually starting to actually get back into expansion only since Q3 of last year, uh, I think this current economic cycle could still have further room to grow. And uh, looking at historical cycle uh, studies, I think uh, this expansion could easily stretch out to 2025 or later. So that's the benchmark that we have, uh, purely just looking at the expansion cycle playing through. I think uh, from now on to 2025, I think uh, we could continue to see this uh, bull market stretching higher, uh, breaking new record highs, mainly looking at your broad-based markets such as your S&P, your Dow, as well as your NASDAQ. Uh, probably in between the way, we could see some pullback of 5 to 10%. Uh, but nonetheless, during a kind of an expansion, a circular bull market setting, uh, usually how the market reacts is whenever we get a kind of a correction, it tends to present a very good uh, buying opportunity. 
uh, for investors to actually latch back onto the uptrend to actually ride it out for the next uh, two to three years out. So that's the general sentiment that we have. Uh, nowhere near the end of a bull market and actually still have further room to go, which I will explain further with this uh, economic data, which I have too. So previous slide shows you the general uh, length of a economic expansion cycle as well as a recession. And if you were to dive in deeper in terms of looking at individual uh, macroeconomic indicator component, uh, two that I'll highlight today, the manufacturing PMI, as well as the industrial production in the next slide. But basically over here, you can see the manufacturing PMI uh, basically shows you the sentiment of uh, manufacturers, uh, asking them questions uh, from the inventory setting, uh, production outlook, uh, labor market sentiment. And uh, this data is actually tabulated every month to get a sensing in terms of uh, the general structure of the market, whether we are kind of uh, moving in an expansion or a recession or contraction. And how we read this is particularly when you look at the PMI, the 50 line over here, anything above 50 tells us uh, that the sentiment is actually positive, while anything below 50 tells us a sentiment that's actually uh, pessimistic as well as a contractionary kind of outlook. So I think looking at this uh, chart over here at the bottom, uh, it's pretty easy to see that this particular PMI indicator actually moves in a cycle uh, and it moves in a cyclical manner where it don't usually stay at an extreme low or an extreme high for too long. So for instance, you can see a markup over here, the red line, which shows you somewhere near 40. Whenever the PMI number actually crashes down to a level uh, of 40 and below, it tends to tell us that we are in some sort of a crisis, some sort of a recession. And uh, this PMI number do not usually stay at those extreme low for too long. And the moment we actually re mean revert back up to the expansion phase, uh, you can see, for example, here uh, in July of 03, as well as in uh, August of 09, uh, when we kind of re-emerge from the crisis low of uh, the dot-com bubble, as well as the GFC over here, uh, the moment we actually went back to the positive level over here, you can see the expansion cycle tends to actually last for at least three to five years out. And the corresponding movement to the broad-based market, uh, for this case, we will use the S&P as a proxy. Uh, you can see over here, the S&P Pyramid Index actually also rallied along with this expansion cycle, uh, respectively with about 57% as well as 109% during both uh, cases over here. So I think we have seen quite a similar replay playing through since the pandemic lockdown of last year in March, uh, where we saw this COVID uh, pandemic actually causing this PMI number to actually crash to this low of 41.7 uh, somewhere in I think April and since the April low we have managed to recover pretty sharply and uh, since June where it actually turned back into the green uh, where it actually rises back above the expansion level of 50 you can see uh, the general sentiment from manufacturers are pretty strong uh, we have actually seen 14 consecutive months of gains since uh, June and you can see the corresponding movement within the S&P is also a positive move to the upside. And uh, in fact, I think since the March low of last year, we have actually gained 100% for the S&P uh, as of yesterday, breaking a new record high. And again, looking at this general cycle uh, in terms of how the PMI works, I think uh, it still suggests to us that we could still easily have another a good two to three years of uh, expansion here in terms of the PMI numbers. And that will likely continue to feedback a uh, higher movement to the upside uh, for this bull market to actually ride on to the upside. So in terms of target-wise, probably it wouldn't surprise me to see maybe the next uh, one to two years out, the S&P actually hitting a high of around 5,000 points. So that could be a likely possibility to play out as we continue to move along to the further phase of reopening. Uh, we should continue to add on to this uh, acceleration within this uh, economic data that we are seeing right now. And moving on to the next one, pretty similar uh, analysis here or a chart. Uh, previous one, I'm showing PMI numbers. Right now, looking at the industrial production year-on-year -year data, you can see a pretty similar cyclical kind of uh, pattern here playing through uh, for industrial production numbers, where it also moves in a cyclical manner where it doesn't stay too low for too long or even too high for too long. Uh, but the key takeaway here is uh, you can see during the period of lockdown since last year due to COVID, uh, the industrial number actually fell to a low of negative 17.6% year-on-year somewhere in March. And since then, we have managed to actually recover back into the positive territory only very recently since March. And since then, we have actually seen four consecutive months of uh, positive gains. Uh, 
uh, which tells us that we are probably only in the early phase of this expansion cycle if we were to look at historical data over here, where you can see during the dot-com bust as well as the global financial crisis recovery phase, uh, the moment industrial production uh, on an annualized basis turned back into the green, uh, the expansion cycle again tends to last for at least a good three to four years out uh, with a corresponding move uh, for the S&P uh, rallying about 60 to 90 percent. So again, with that in mind, with the cycles that is kind of backing us that we are still nowhere near the end of an expansion cycle, I think it's clear to say that probably this uh, bull market within the broad-based market has a further room to go. And uh, it wouldn't surprise us to see uh, further record uh, numbers here being broken for the S&P, the uh, NASDAQ, as well as the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, probably over the next two to three years out. So just keep that in mind, I think the key takeaway here is uh, we are nowhere near the end of an expansion cycle. And we do believe uh, buying the deep, buying on correction remains the key strategy here. And uh, if and when we get any form of uh, correction here in the near term for the broad-based market, say a 5 to 10% correction, I think, uh, those who present a good buying opportunity, which I'll uh, kind of uh, explain and touch in a while with some price section chart. Uh, one last inter interesting chart before we move on to price section. So right now, I think the key concern here is uh, when and how much the Fed will actually taper. Uh, current market consensus is expecting the Fed to announce some form of tapering discussion to happen in September FOMC meeting. And looking the, at the stronger labor market data that was reported last Friday, where unemployment rate actually fell to 5.4%, and uh, the non-farm payroll actually coming shy of 1 million, uh, kind of a breaking expectation, I think uh, that could bring forward the expectation that the Fed could actually announce some form of uh, the tapering announcement, uh, probably even as soon as uh, next week during the uh, Jackson Hole meeting. So key thing to look over here, if that is being announced, probably we could see a knee-jerk reaction lower here within the S&P 500 index. But nonetheless, uh, I think the key takeaway here is if we were to look at the Fed's balance sheet, the general trend over here is uh, definitely moving to the upside. And even if they were to mention any form of tapering, uh, the balance sheet will still continue to grow, but only at a slower rate. So if you were to look back in time, the last time the Fed actually announced this form of tapering, that was actually back in 2013 over here. Uh, where the balance sheet actually continues to grow, but only at a slower rate. Uh, the corresponding movement to the general equity market still remains uh, in an uptrend uh, and continue to actually break record highs, uh, even though we went through a period of uh, tapering during 2013 as well as 2014. So the key takeaway here is as long as the Fed is still pumping money into the market, even though at a slower rate, I think uh, the general market will continue to ride high until we go through a period of uh, quantitative tightening which is the one that we saw here in 2018 where the Fed actually pulls money out of the market. So you can see over here 2018 where the balance sheet was being sh uh, stringed from a 4.4 trillion to 3.76 trillion over here. Uh, the corresponding movement within the S&P 500 index is actually seeing some choppiness where we saw the market actually fell 11 to 20% uh, over a period of uh, two to three months. So Key takeaway here is until we reach that point of quantitative tightening, I think uh, the general market will still remain healthy and strong. And probably for that time frame to play out, uh, we are talking about 2023 and later uh, until the Fed actually goes about uh, hiking interest rate. So from now to 2023, I think we should continue to see this smooth selling market here uh, in terms of uh, the market continue to buy the deep uh, and continue to ride along to the upside, breaking new record highs, uh, moving along to probably 2023. So the last one before we go on to Q&A, uh, again, I'm a technical analyst, so looking at charts give us a good uh, representation in terms of uh, where to begin buying uh, and looking out for some buying opportunities. So here's the S&P 500 index on the daily time frame. Uh, year to date, we are actually up about 17%, which is one of the strongest gain in history. And uh, if you were to look, uh, since the start of this year, we have actually seen about one, two, three, four, five, five periods of correction. Uh, but nonetheless, each correction phase that actually play out was pretty shallow, uh, ranging from about 3 to 6% from its peak to 12 before we see the general market actually right back to the upside again, uh, and again, seeking out for new record high. So that's the general structure here that we are seeing here for the uh, S&P 500 index uh, that tends to actually play out this way during this early phase of uh, economic expansion cycle that is being supported by a uh, strong economic growth that we are seeing uh, that I just laid out. So. Uh, probably key thing to note is uh, using the 20 and 60 day moving average, this red and blue line, uh, those usually represent a good starting point for uh, accumulation. 
uh, as a technical analyst, usually uh, for traders, we will look to buy around those levels, which uh, seems to be the case here. Uh, for the S&P, it seems like the blue line, the 60-day moving average does present a very good uh, starting point for accumulation to trying to catch the bottom here, which I've highlighted here in green. Uh, you can see every single time we dip down to the blue line. Uh, since the start of this year, we managed to actually bounce back higher, uh, breaking out to new record high uh, on each occasion. So right now, I think the key buy zone for the S&P is around uh, 4,225 points to 4,300 points uh, over here, which is where the 60-day moving average is. So instead of, I think, chasing here, right now where the S&P is uh, right at the record high, I think it's uh, better to exercise some patience. Uh, probably waiting for this pullback of around 5% to play out before uh, looking out to buy at around this level of uh, 4,235 points to 4,300 points uh, would likely be a more wise strategy as uh, looking at the current momentum, it does look like it's uh, right now stalling. So that is what the current price section is showing here. Yeah, so just to sum up, I think right now, uh, giving a very quick overview in terms of where we are in this expansion cycle as well as economic data uh, standpoint. I think we are right now in this Goldilocks kind of environment, uh, mainly firstly because we still have ample fiscal support uh, coming out from uh, the uh, Treasury. Uh, mainly again, over the past few weeks, we have actually seen the 1.2 trillion uh, infrastructure bill that's being passed uh, from the Senate. And then after which the more recent 3.5 trillion uh, budget resolution that's being mentioned again last week that's being passed by Senate. Uh, that will likely be passed sometime later in uh, September as well as October. Both will continue to fit through to uh, probably a bullish sentiment within the equity market that uh, the market can, can actually hang on uh, to justify for this high valuation, especially within uh, the infrastructure side of things. Uh, your industrial stocks such as Dow that has kind of been outperforming over the past one to two weeks. And then at the same time, we have also this ample monetary accommodation that is still uh, kind of a present here in the market, even though we are talking about tapering. Uh, but nonetheless, the Fed is still pumping money out uh, into the market, but just at a slower pace. And I think the more important one would be this uh, vaccine rollout that will eventually fit back towards uh, eventual global reopening that will likely spur tourism. Uh, pent up demand definitely will be one to watch uh, in terms of uh, increasing demand that will kind of uh, fit back into higher earnings and then at the same time, a higher valuation. Uh, higher equity prices to the upside uh, in the near term. So I think all in right now, there seems to be this Goldilocks environment that will likely present uh, this current setting that is right and uh, right for actually buying the deep, uh, buying on uh, weakness uh, if and when we actually see any form of uh, correction playing through. So all in, I think strategy-wise, we'll continue to look to buy uh, on uh, any weakness, uh, any pullback. Uh, and again, again like, like I show in terms of the price section chart in the previous slide, uh, key levels to look out for buying the deep as a tip over here for those that actually uh, watch the chart and practice some uh, tech technical analysis is to look out to buy somewhere near the 20 and 60 day moving average as uh, both levels tend to actually be the springboard that actually propels price higher uh, from a general trending perspective. So uh, probably just some trading instrument or uh, investable instrument uh, for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the ETF to track is uh, DIA. Uh, for S&P, will be SPY. And uh, for the tech-heavy NASDAQ uh, ETF to track is uh, QQQ. And uh, probably just before I end, uh, two key sectors that usually tend to benefit well uh, in this early phase of uh, expansion uh, when the economic data are actually accelerating, uh, mainly are your financials as well as energy. So two ETFs that actually track this will be uh, XLF for the financial. And uh, for oil, uh, it will be XLE as well as X. XLE as well as XLRE. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I've probably come to the end. Uh, right now, we'll pass the time back to Steve where we'll discuss some of the questions that's, that's been posted to us. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Sounds like, um, yeah, sounds like it's uh, your takeaway is to uh, hashtag BTFD by the dip, right? I think that's, yeah, that's the key takeaway. I guess that, that strategy hasn't failed in the past uh, however many years, so. Um, yeah, thank you for that, uh, for that informative uh, presentation. So um, I think for now, we're probably going to move on to some questions because we've actually received a lot of questions throughout this Driven Campaign series from uh, previous webinars. So we're going to shoot out a few questions to the panel here. Um, and I'll share my screen first just so that everyone can kind of see, uh, see the questions and it's clear. Um, OK. 
Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Okay, so the first question is, um, how big of a drop in the US market are we anticipating when the bear market, I guess, eventually comes? Um, I think, Jeremy, this probably is more in your uh, sort of wheelhouse, so maybe you want to take that. I mean, what's your thoughts? And then maybe we can kind of hear from uh, Sebun and Bertram after. Yep. So I guess it's uh, pretty simple to measure the pick to trough sell off during periods of bear market. So I think the two most relevant one that we can talk about would be your dot-com bubble, as well as your global financial crisis. And during those, both periods, uh, what we saw uh, was a pick to trough sell off of actually more than 50%. So if we are actually talking about a bear market actually kicking into the market uh, soon, then probably we are talking about that kind of a magnitude actually playing out uh, of a 50% pick to trough sell off. Uh, we're looking at right now the Dow, the S&P being at 4,400 points. We are looking at probably uh, S&P dropping down to somewhere near 2,500 points. But however, if I can add on to that, uh, it does seem unlikely that the bear market would actually hit us, mainly because right now we are nowhere near that kind of state in terms of looking at economic numbers. Uh, looking at uh, some key black swan events, I think the only thing that can actually bring us back to that state is uh, if the Delta variant turns into something that is even more dangerous, uh, bring us back to again a period of lockdown like last year or even worse, causing a higher fatality rate from COVID-19, then that could be a possibility in terms of us uh, turning back into a bear market of that severity. But other than that exogenous shock, I think it's uh, almost uh, an unlikely kind of a scenario that we'll see that playing out as uh, again, like I laid out, the particular bull market cycle right now is still rather strong. And uh, again, we don't expect that to actually play out. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Um, Sebun, do you have, do you have any, anything to add to that? Oh, Sebun, you're, you're on mute. You're on mute, Sebun. My apologies, I'm still, I, I was still on mute. Yeah, yeah, no, I can hear you now, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, we can hear you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right, look, as Jeremy was saying, the more extreme bear markets uh, see about 45 to 50% wipeout of values. Uh, but if you go back in history, back to 1929, the average bear market is actually about 35 to 36% downside and the average length of a bear market is about nine and a half months so that's the sort of thing you're looking at uh like jeremy i'm not expecting a bear market this year um and i think a bear market is also a low probability event in the first half of next year but I'm not as confident as Jeremy is of the bull market extending to 2025. The thing to look out for, I think, to keep an open mind is the yield gap. Uh, and I think that's the, the key thing to look at, which is the gap between the index earnings yield minus the 10-year US Treasury yield. Right now, we are running 330 basis points, 3.3%. Uh, the earnings yield on the S&P 500 is 330 basis points higher than the 10-year US Treasury yield. So that's going to uh, continue to drive, as Jeremy said, uh, money back into the market on the pullback. So um, keep an eye on that. Uh, I don't see a bear market uh, this year, but I do see uh, that investors should moderate their returns expectations for uh, the second half of this year and indeed for the first half of next year as well. Moderate your expectations. There could be a correction. Uh, money will come back in again, but overall returns will be a lot lower for this year compared to last year okay so do you, do you say like the the yield gap is some like a key metric that they should watch for, for where the market is going to head it's one of the things you should watch i mean you it in some ways brings together uh, a lot of valuation sort of issues 
your your earnings yield is of course the inverse of your PE ratio. So that brings in your PE ratio, but it also sort of adjusts for the uh, um, the what's the word for it the discount rate for your uh, net present valuation. So you bring these two elements together, it does tend, it, it doesn't capture everything, but it does tend to capture quite a few things. And in your earnings seal, it also captures the stuff that Jeremy talks about, which is the economic sort of growth rate. The economic growth rates are meaningless unless they reflect into the corporate earnings growth. So uh, that sort of brings all of these things together. So it's not the only thing, but yeah. Uh, it does bring a lot of things together. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, Bertram, I can bring you in on this one. There's a follow-up uh, question kind of related to the end of the bear market. And um, this is the second question, which I think uh, kind of relates to the first. Obviously, how long will it take until the bear market cycle ends? But have you got any thoughts on recommended ETFs that can kind of, uh, or a play on inflation, or I guess a hedge, I think would be, would be the word for it? Um, no, I, I guess uh, I'm not uh, able to give you a recommendation on, on uh, ETFs, um, but I will comment on the discussion that, that you've just had with, in terms of you know, this market and, and I guess how it's going to play out. Um, from a fundamental perspective, um, what, I, what we're hearing from companies in the US is that the demand uh, situation is extremely strong. And that doesn't look like it's slowing down at all. Okay, um, so that that's the first thing. A lot of the um, uh, consumption areas, uh, housing, are uh, in massive expansion mode. In fact, inventory levels in the U.S. are at all-time, well, almost all-time lows. Right. So this does look like it's going to be an expansion that continues uh, for a while. Right. How long it is, there's a lot of, uh, of, of, I guess, water to pass under the bridge, but at least we're not seeing um, a, a short-term uh, you know, correction, um, apart from maybe a technical one. Um, where there is, are stresses in the market, uh, as I think your, your, that question is alluding to uh, on inflation, and obviously right now uh, real uh, rates are negative. Um, and that is a situation which is uh, inevitably going to be short term. Okay, so um, you're going to have to see a rise uh, in uh, interest rates, and that will cause some issues in the equities market uh, for sure. So I think um, having some inflation hedges is, is definitely um, a good idea. Um, from an ETF side, I, I, I don't have one to recommend. Um, but um, I think that's definitely something that's worth looking at. I think um, the, the other thing that is playing out, which I don't think we should forget, okay, is that uh, we're right now in, I guess, the third global wave of, uh, of uh, the virus. And that's causing a lot of market action uh, to actually occur. So if you look at the performance of the US market since about June, it has basically reflected the performance of the market when the virus first started uh, in early uh, 2020. In terms of the sector outperformance, so there's been this rotation back towards uh, tech um, and away from, I guess, the reopening plays, which were more in favor in the second quarter. But given what companies are saying um, in terms of the demand environment being very strong, um, that looks like it's probably going to reverse again, right? So um, uh, there should be a, a, a I guess, a rotation back towards the reopening side. So I think Jeremy had identified sectors such as uh, uh, banks and energy, and they are sectors that, that uh, definitely uh, we like as well. So um, I think the, the, the market reaction is, is in the US um, shouldn't reflect the same situation as you saw at the beginning of last year. Um, and it, it is interesting because obviously this is now a you know, huge geopolitical issue. I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing is that this whole two COVID speeds that, that, that we have, the ways of managing COVID uh, in the world with uh, most of Asia still sticking with a zero COVID policy, uh, which is actually going to actually disrupt a lot of supply chain. So you see shortages in things like IC 
um, uh, semiconductors, um, certain components on the electronic side. So I guess what I would uh, say about that is that there are dangers in playing the broader market and the ETFs and, you know, being a fundamental guy myself, um, I prefer a, a much more uh, bottom-up stock picking approach. Um, you know, we've had, I think, two or three, well, actually we're in results season right now. We've had companies report surprisingly bad results because they haven't been able to get the components to sell. And that's had ripple effects throughout the entire chain, uh, value chain. And then we've had companies with supersized margins, right? So I think, you know, it, it, it really does need to take a more of a stock picking approach, especially out here in Asia, when you see those value chains under pressure. How do you see, Tim, how do you see like the Tim, whole Delta uh, area? Yes. Sorry, go on, Tim. Tim, perhaps if I can jump in here, I'd be quite happy to jump in, in term, not in terms of the ETFs for the inflation plays, but in terms of sectors and the asset yeah. classes that you yeah, yeah, go yeah, for. Yeah. Uh, if you were a believer in inflation, yeah, so the the very conventional so, sort of uh, sectors and asset classes uh, to buy to buy buy into either directly through equities or through ETFs um, would be commodities, of course. Uh, now, gold is conventionally touted as an, an inflation play, but you, you've got to be a little bit careful with that because in the early stages of, of inflation, when um, um, yields are going up, when the 10-year US Treasury yield is going up in anticipation of inflation, that actually works against gold. Because if you look back over 20 to 30 years, gold generally trades negatively correlated to the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. So the early stages of inflation when the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield is rising uh, can work against gold. But at the later stages when inflation really hits and then the real yield, the real 10-year U.S. Treasury yield starts going back down again because inflation is going up, that's when gold starts to perform. So gold is a later stage inflation play. But there's something that I would urge investors in this part of the world to look at if you believe in inflation is actually REITs. Now, the conventional wisdom is that rising interest rates work against REITs, which, which is fine, which is fine because REITs are a quasi sort of fixed income play, as it were. So rising interest rates should work against REITs based on that yield that they provide you. But remember that if you're, if you're talking about serious inflation, not just rising rates, yeah, serious inflation, real hard assets and real estate is a hard asset, is an inflation hedge. And mm -hmm. uh, as you face uh, real inflation, if you're talking serious inflation here, I think REITs, uh, that rising inflation should actually work in favor of REITs that hold quality assets, quality real assets. Does that relate to their pricing power just in real estate terms? I mean, real estate, obviously, as a landlord, do they have that pricing power? Is that why? So kind of that's, that? the, that's exactly right, Tim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because as prices go up, yeah. qual and I stress quality assets, yeah? Yeah. yeah, they can pass on that that inflation in higher uh, rentals, yeah. right? So to yeah. offset that. So, uh, and we are seeing, and there is a reason why we're seeing real estate, physical property booming everywhere, right? From, uh, from, from the United Kingdom uh, to Korea, yeah. to Australia is there is this fear of the loss of buying power from paper currency. Right. And that is yeah. a very simple sort of explanation to sort of put why I think REITs are actually something you want to think about yeah. if you believe in inflation. I mean, right? so, I mean, how about like Bertram and Jeremy, what, do you, what are your thoughts on, you know, crypto versus gold? I mean, there's a lot of talk in the market about crypto being some sort of inflation hedge and then, mm -hmm. You're kind of seeing data coming out when 
you know, there are outflows of crypt from crypto ETFs. There's, in, there's there are inflows into gold ETFs. So it seems like there's, you know, there's a lot of market debate about which one is the hedge or, you know, where, you know, I guess where, where is, where's the hot bet on an inflation hedge? And so what, what are your thoughts on, on crypto and gold on, on those fronts? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in first here. So I guess right now, the crypto side of things will be mainly tied towards the market sentiment. That's still quite a bit of a meme stock kind of play, where whenever we see market sentiment getting super euphoric, uh, that is when we actually see Bitcoin actually getting crazy. Uh, for instance, over the past uh, one month or so, we have seen Bitcoin actually bounce off uh, of the 30,000 low and actually recover 50% or more. So in terms of an inflation hedge, uh, I would say uh, this cryptocurrency do have a place there mainly because I think the market participants do actually believe that they have some sort of a alternative uh, characteristic that's being tied to it right now that we haven't really seen uh, in the past. Because again, cryptocurrency is something new. Bitcoin came in since uh, 2009, if I'm not wrong. So in fact, we have only seen one round of uh, crisis playing through, which is the COVID pandemic. And even during that period, uh, we can see Bitcoin actually instead uh, outperform almost all the asset class there. So I guess in terms of during periods of uh, rising inflation, even talking about hyperinflation, uh, mainly again right now, everyone is afraid whether this inflation is actually transitory or not. Uh, but if and when this inflation does prove to be non-transitory, I think uh, people will actually rush uh, towards both uh, goal, which is the conventional inflation hedge, and also at the same time actually chase into cryptocurrency such as your Bitcoin, as well as Ethereum, where they do believe that it does also have a kind of a place within the portfolio as a small part of it. And probably just one point to point towards a cryptocurrency. I think right now, the market penetration in terms of funds holding into cryptocurrency is actually very, very small. And uh, we have not yet really gotten a mainstream ETF that actually tracks Bitcoin. And right now, I think there's a lot of regulation in place that is actually pushing forwards. Uh, and once the regulation gets passed, and eventually there's a Bitcoin ETF, I think that would actually cause a flurry of money uh, as a mainstream means of getting safe uh, holdings of cryptocurrency uh, yeah. without the hassle of actually getting to know how to store it in the wallet and stuff. And uh, yeah. that could actually be another key catalyst that could uh, be the attraction right. for this cryptocurrency as an inflation hedge. Right, right. Hmm. Okay, cool. Bertram, do you, do you have anything to add on that? Um, you know, I, I think when we when we talk about these kind of uh, financial assets, you know, there's always uh, some real underlying demand or some uh, long term relationship that we can we can point to. I think with crypto, um, you know, it, it's basically a it, there is no real underlying demand uh, uh, per se, even though you know the technology is 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 solid and that there is a a potential real usage for it. So it, it is being driven by speculation right now. So the, the question I would have is, yes, um, there is regulation coming. Um, right now, it is fairly unregulated in how you buy and sell. And uh, who's to say Bitcoin at 58,000 is, you know, is the right level to get in over the long term. So, you know, I find it difficult personally to, um, uh, to I guess, see crypto is more than a extremely short-term trading uh, strategy definitely not as an inflation hedge if it's trading at you know 70,000 um, but um, you know and, and I think that there are maybe longer term less volatile ways of, of playing inflation as mentioned by say Boone uh, real estate is, is a great is a great uh, way to play it as well right um, okay Thanks. Um, okay, I think we'll move on to the next question here with um, with regards to uh, China. We're getting quite a few questions uh, just on China. Um, so this one is looking at, uh, you know, the China market. I mean, how, how much will the US market be affected by the China market in future? And then I guess this leads on to uh, the question of like, are there any thoughts on, you know, the regulatory crackdown in China? Um, and we've also got a question just come in from the audience about whether, you know, people should be purchasing ADRs listed in the US and whether it should be instead everyone should be buying in Hong Kong and obviously mainland China and A shares and whether the ADR market is that effectively dead. Um, so I don't know, like, do you, do you want to take that on first, Bertram? 
Yeah, that's uh, okay. This is a really uh, wide ranging. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, okay, so I'll try to keep it extremely short, and, and then we can drill in and, uh, a, a little bit. I think. Okay, so so firstly, let's talk about uh, tech regulation in China. Um, I think a lot is being made of the regulation. I think you know a lot of it is um, is in line with the policies that the government has been talking about for quite some time. Okay, so really it shouldn't have come as as much of a surprise as it has. And at the same time, the market reaction, I think, has overstated the impact. Okay, now it is true, definitely, that, you know, the, the super growth that we have seen in the tech names in terms of the revenue um, is going to slow. Uh, and it's true that margins are going to get squeezed. So uh, I think we are in for a, a definitely a consolidation period in most of the major tech Chinese names where uh, earnings are going to come down, to, earnings growth will come down to a, a, a another level, right? And the market needs to digest that because there were a lot of investors in those names continuing to expect hyper growth uh, going forward, okay? So, so that's the first thing. I, I think... It hasn't killed the tech market. I think the the, the valuations uh, need to reflect the new reality, and I think the the underlying businesses uh, still remain quite strong. Um, I think um, in terms of the ADRs, so definitely. Okay, so this is another dimension, which is uh, this U.S. Uh, China uh, trade or tensions, I guess, overall. <laughs> Definitely, the ADRs have been hit. A lot of the ADRs uh, were uh, in sectors um, which have come under increasing regulation um, for, you know, I guess, reasons of the Chinese government wanting to, to I guess, uh, grow their industries in a healthy way um, and ensure that, you know, the, the, the capital going to fund those industries um, is, is, is being directed in, in, in healthy ways. Uh, so, you know, that affected education and, uh, you know, Tencent recently in gaming as well, um, although Tencent's not an ADR. So uh, what I would say is, um, I guess the uh, the China uh, ADR ETF is down about 50% from its uh, peak earlier in this year. And that is reflected in a lot of uh, those fears and a lot of funds leaving. I think given the lack of uh, transparency right now, I don't see the ADRs bouncing back um, in the near term, um, at least not until uh, we start to hear an end to the, uh, I guess, the, the in increasing uh, regulatory environment in China. Um, yeah. So definitely not a short short term thing, um, yeah. and investors need to be careful. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Bertram. Uh, Sebun, do, do you have any thoughts on, on, on China as a whole or, or the crackdown? Yeah, I sure do. Yeah. Look, Tim, yeah. Um, I, I agree with what uh, Bertram said about too much being made of the regulatory controls being imposed by China. Uh, now, I've and you would know that I've written about this for the prosperous uh, um website. Now, uh, China is regulating big tech. It is doing exactly what developed market governments have been talking a big game about, but doing very little of. That is regulating on stuff like leveling the playing field between fintechs and banks. That was what happened with uh, Ant Financial. Now, Ant Financial was making loans like banks do uh, without the capital adequacy ratios of banks, without the, uh, the leverage controls on banks. So they were leveling that playing field and why not? Uh, they were uh, regulating on the antitrust, anti-competitive practices of big tech. Like um, you can be on only you you got to choose between Coca Cola or Pepsi Cola. You can't be on Alibaba and you can't be on JD.com at the same time. Now that's anti-competitive. So they're breaking the walls down. They were working on things like data privacy, consumer protection. So none of that is particularly unusual, right? Mm -hmm. But the media made much too much of it. But 
to be fair, not all sections of the media made too much of this. So I, and you know, I wrote about this, that the yeah. Washington Post, the yeah. Washington Post said that, and this is in their headline, China is doing what the US can seem to do, which is to regulate its tech giants, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Tom Wheeler, I think his name is Tom Wheeler, who was formerly chairman of the US Federal Commission, uh, sorry, Federal Communication Commission, described it recently uh, as the, the Chinese regulatory controls as pro-market, as anti-monopoly and pro-innovation opening of big company chokeholds on digital mm. transformation, right? So none of that is particularly new. The media, some sections of the media has just made too much of this. Now, uh, so it's become a bit indiscriminate, but like Bertram, I'm also not particularly crazy about uh, the offshore Chinese internet companies. Now, we've got to remember one thing, they have got a huge vulnerability. They are all VIEs, variable interest entities, which the lawyers have been telling us for the last two, two years or so, that they are, uh, well, borderline illegal, right? They have been structured to bypass China's foreign investment rules that foreigners cannot own shares in internet companies, in education companies, right? So that's a vulnerability there. So uh, if I were to invest in China tech, I would invest in the A shares. I yeah. would not invest yeah. in the, uh, the offshore China tech companies, the VIEs because they have this vulnerability. But that said, that said, I do not buy into the idea that China is trying to crush all its yeah. offshore tech companies. I do not mm. buy that. Yeah. They are trying to bring them in line with their national policy sort of priorities, bearing in mind that they yeah. are existing on the gray area of legality but just follow the priorities so so i'm 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 not overly bearish i'm not crazy about the offshore china internet companies but if you look at 10 cent on um on the the hong kong stock exchange what is it 700 right 700 yeah. hk right yeah. uh, if you have got the risk for appetite, and I'm not recommending this, but you can see it's done a huge sort of decline. It's, it's, it's and the technical analyst may be able to speak more to this. It appears to be forming a bottom. So if you're a trader, you might want to look at that. Yeah. And yeah. I'd favor uh, 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 trading the indiscriminate selling of all Chinese stocks all Chinese stocks because of the regulatory blitz on the offshore internet. So you could even look at the uh, pillars of the Chinese economy that have been sold off to the banks, the insurers, yeah. the selected, yeah. selected property companies, selected manufacturers. The right. CSI 300 has fallen 20, 21% top to bottom buying opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, what, what, what's everyone's thoughts on, on these names kind of being re-rated or derated and it staying at these, you know, depressed valuations? Because there's obviously concern about, um, you know, the VIE structure and the offshore listings, but is that superseded by having control over the data? And because the party wants control over the data, is that going to turn them into sort of utility-like stocks, sort of like bank stocks in terms of these depressed, you know, I mean, obviously not price the book, but depressed valuations on the PE front. Is it going to be a way where data is controlled to the detriment of profits? And is this kind of a permanent thing? I mean, I this is a lot of speculation, I guess, about what the party <laughs> thinking, but I'm just like, I'm just, you know, I guess like, yeah, it's a hypothetical about where, where do you think it's going to land, they say, in like years. Can, can I, I let, let me jump in here because actually I as you mentioned I carry two hats or I wear two hats um, and I want to do make a shout out to ESG 
investing, right? So taking a look in a structured way at the environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities for the companies, right? And that's something that we're putting out across all of our, our research uh, right now. Um, but, you know, if we look at what happened to Tencent, right? So here's the story is in June, we held a global panel where we had ESG experts from Europe, US, and China. And the China expert was, we only look at environmental, social is not a, an issue for us here in China. Literally a month later, you, uh, you have the Tencent situation, which is a purely social risk, which was apparent, it was being discussed, but the market had completely decided not to price that in. So what I would say is those questions that you raise, um, yes, you can look at E, S, and G components of it. My personal view, again, is there's not enough transparency. The government is increasing regulation. They are going to require all the data uh, to be shared uh, centrally. And I think that creates a lot of uh, potential risks, right, over the business models of those companies. So until that becomes more transparent, um, I think that, you know, it's a sector where we need to wait and, and see uh, yeah. or avoid. But at the same time, so again, a shout out to the ESG side, uh, investing side, is that there are a lot of companies that will actually benefit from increased regulation. So if you take a look at uh, what's happening on the E side in China, they just launched a, 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 a carbon market. And again, the details of that are not yet clear, but that is going to... Uh, uh, allow the trading or, or offsets from you know large carbon producers um, to 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 I guess more environmentally friendly companies who will be able to uh, to benefit from that. So sectors such as the EV sector in China should be one of the beneficiaries in the medium to long term um, of the setup of this carbon market in China. So I think that there are definite long term bets that can be placed around. ESG, we don't need to be, I mean, the regulation will hurt some existing business models and will create new business models. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. I think we'll kind of swing to um, back to the US. We've got a question here um, on views on the US market as a whole. Uh, what are your views on the NASDAQ or the US tech sector? Um, Jeremy, do you want to kind of take this one? Yeah. I guess right now, the key thing that's actually moving the tech heavy NASDAQ will be looking at the 10 year U because both have actually quite a bit of a negative correlation there. And especially with the recent move here where we saw the uh, 10 year U actually starting to reprice in a possibility of a paper uh, happening real soon, uh, possibly even by next week being mentioned or by September. Uh, as we see this repricing of the 10 year U, uh, slowly play through. Right now, it's, I believe, at about 1.3%. If we continue to reprice higher for the uh, actual announcement of the tapering, uh, probably we are talking about 10-year yield that could easily rise back up to about 1.6%, 1.7% range. And uh, with that in mind, I think the uh, as a broad-based kind of a correlation, I think the uh, tech heaviness that we actually see a knee-jerk reaction lower, uh, mainly due to that correlation. So I think right now that uh, seems to be the kind of uh, movement that we are seeing from the market that is slowly pricing in that particular move. And uh, I think the key thing, key data to watch will be uh, next month's labor market data because we have already seen one month of a strong growth after three consecutive months of a uh, kind of underwhelming number. So I think some of the Fed members has actually mentioned uh, all they probably need is just two consecutive months of uh, outperformance in terms of the labor market to actually confirm that they have the uh, enough validity in terms of uh, the tapering to play through. And uh, once that happens, I think we could see that uh, unwinding actually play out. Okay. And any thoughts on the tech sector or, or like, what, what, you know, what, what your, what's your thoughts on, I guess, valuations in, in tech? Because obviously there's a lot of talk about that. So I guess looking at the general broad-based tech sector, just purely talking about your FANG stocks, uh, we still do have some that are even though a little bit rich in terms of valuation, but I would still say looking at what our US research partner puts out, uh, looking at the Apple numbers, looking at the uh, Facebook numbers, I think they still do expect uh, a higher valuation to actually play out. Uh, and again, looking at the general market as a cyclical perspective, uh, as long as we are in this kind of a bullish setup in terms of uh, this uh, economic expansion cycle, 
uh, even though we do might get actually some uh, near term correction, near term pullback within this bank stocks, this tech heavy stocks. Uh, all in all, in terms of a longer term perspective, if you take a one year view out, uh, usually these heavyweight tech stocks such as your bank stocks would most probably be uh, way higher than where we are from current price if you were to look one year out. So yeah. if I can just purely put it out, I would still say, uh, given a one year time frame, I would say probably this tech heavy stocks would still be uh, way above where we are right now. Okay. Hmm. Um, thanks. Thanks. Sebu, any thoughts on on tech or, or, or the US yeah, market? Sure. Um, yeah. Look, um, fourth quarter of last year, as you would know, that I, I made the call to, to rotate away from tech towards the old economy for want of another words, that is financials, uh, uh, financials, energy, industrials. Um, and I'm still sticking with that call. And that call has done quite well for the first half of this year uh, versus tech and consumer discretionary which have generally performed quite poorly for the first half of this year. Would you, so change, your, sticking... would you change your mind if, if the Delta variant sort of ah, takes it? No, that's a very good point, Tim. And, and thank yeah. you for raising that. And I will sort of address that a little bit later. But let me uh, finish the point that I was going to make. Yeah. No, now, sorry, tech has a certain vulnerability, has a greater vulnerability to rising interest rates and rising 10-year US Treasury yields because a larger part of the valuation of tech stocks is in more distant blue sky earnings, right? Yeah, uh, because you have a, a fabulous technology that is the future, right? That is going to be something wonderful in five years' time. But so there, there is this greater vulnerability, if you like, duration risk. There's greater yeah. duration risk of rising interest rates for tech, less so with industrials and energy, which is, you know, we just want to know what you're going to make next year, right? Yeah. So Earnings the greater day, part, right? yeah. that's yeah. it. So they have less duration risk. So, so, right. so I'll stick with the lower duration risk, boring old economy, financials, uh, energy, industrial, and real estate, right? Now, uh, to Delta. Um, and I'm in lockdown number six in Melbourne. So I do understand a little bit about Delta um, and it's happening everywhere. But look, I think we have got to look at uh, the signs and, and I'm not a scientist and I'm just simply reading the signs. The data is telling us that vaccinations do work. There's been a lot of speculation on social media about how vaccinations fail, right? You're always going to find somebody who's getting sick, who's had two shots, right? So, but the data tells us that uh, for most vaccines, it's 90% effective against serious, serious illness and hospitalization. Now, it is very interesting because you are sitting in Singapore. So for Singaporeans and actually the whole world, watch what is happening in Singapore now. Because Singapore has got 73% vaccination, fully vaccinated rate now, right? And if you account for those who have had their first shot, we're going to be 80% fully vaccinated by the end of this month, I think, plus or minus a week or two. So Singapore would be one of the highest, if not the highest vaccinated uh, uh, populations in the world. And Singapore has started reopening gradually with uh, the return of dining, right? So you're getting a return of dining. Uh, and the calculated risk that the Singapore government is making is that yes, as they reopen, people will get sick, but uh, a relatively few will require hospitalization and the hospitals should be able to take care of most of them. And some will die, of course, some will die, which is tragic, but uh, that happens with most diseases, right? Some people will die. Um, so, but society moves on. So, so I think we've got to watch what's happening in Singapore. My guess is 
on the basis of the data on the people who get seriously ill, the fully vaccinated who get seriously ill, we will get past this. This is not COVID forever. This is long COVID, but this is not COVID forever. Okay, um, Bertram, would you like to chime in? Sure. It looks like uh, uh, Tim's uh, dropped off, but I, I definitely I, I'll just jump in right now and just say I agree with uh, what Sebun has said. Um, a couple of things. Yes, I agree on on the Delta uh, uh, peak uh, will probably uh, be behind us in places like the UK or Europe, um, or maybe a few weeks ahead of us in the US, but. Uh, they both major economies will load uh, will avoid uh, any lockdown and hence we, we will avoid that demand uh, cliff um, so I think um, uh, that's that's not going to be an issue I think on um, on how the economy then goes going forward as I mentioned I think since June uh, the market has reflected a performance very similar to that at the start of 2020. Um, so I think as Delta uh, peaks, uh, at least the way that our U.S. Uh, partners, uh, research partners are, are seeing it, uh, you will see that reversal. And that reversal will go back from the tech names into uh, the reopening names. It will go into, I guess, the second year of the bull market, uh, which will be expansion into uh, small and mid caps. So I'm not so much in favor or, or as bullish on the tech names. I think definitely you can look at stocks like Apple and uh, and see their you know really strong business model, which is actually you know driven by uh, a very very strong product lineup um, that they that they are launching and have launched, uh, or the wearables market, which is really taking off, of course. Um, rather than it being a general, I, I guess tech um, tech driven rally um, that we've seen, I guess over the last ten years. So yeah, I am more in favor of, of looking into the sort of the broader index um, and into smaller mid caps and, and less in favor of tech. Okay, thanks Bertram. Uh, sorry everyone, yep. I just cut out randomly my, my internet. Sorry sorry to have missed the last bit of your uh, your answer, Sabrin. Um, I think we can move on to the uh, next question. We've got a bit of a uh, off the beaten track question here, I guess. I don't know if you guys right. will have an opinion on this, but. Does the issue of Afghanistan at the moment, all the um, obviously the US pulling out of Afghanistan and, and all the chaos there, does that have any impact at all on markets in the US and globally? You want me to jump in? Yeah, go, go on, Sabrina. You can take this first if you want. Yeah. Look, I've I've been saying this for a very long time that very often the media uh shoehorns, force fits, uh, explanations for market movements, which um, may be merely the motion of the ocean, as it were. So if you look at uh, the markets currently, um, uh, the S&P 500 is technically, uh, in terms of the oscillators, and Jeremy would be able to relate to this, uh, a near term, very overbought, near term, very overbought. So, you know, uh, they're just looking for any sort of explanation for what is essentially a technically overbought near term situation. No, I don't think Afghanistan has any impact. If you look back at history, uh, markets are very, very impervious to geopolitics very, very impervious to geopolitics. Now, if you look at the Second World War, uh, the bottom of the, the, the Dow Jones in the Second World War was 1943. And then it rallied through the worst points to the darkest moments of the Second World War, right? So, so the markets are quite impervious to human pain. Right, so uh, it rallied right through to the, and indeed the market corrected after the Second World War. So it's very perverse. So I think no, no, not at all. Okay, uh, I think yeah, I think we can we can leave that one there. Um, I think we've got one on 
managing our risks in long-term investments. So let me just kind of uh, flash this one up for the audience, the previous one that we've got. So how do we manage our risks for long-term investments and what should we look out for? Um, Bertram, do you, want to, do you want to take this first? Yeah, I mean, okay. So one, this is a very, very difficult um, difficult uh, one to answer broadly. Um, I think, um, you know, fundamentally, again, um, uh, we like to buy companies that are building uh, the business models of the future um, that uh, show, uh, I guess, robust fundamentals. Um, of course, there are lots of companies uh, uh, like that that are overvalued um, or are not structured well. They may carry very high debt loads, et cetera. So all kinds of um, accidents can occur. So, you know, when selecting an investment for the long term, uh, I think you, you buy companies that you can understand that you like. Um, Apple is a great example. Um, and you want to enter that, you know, in a... In a, in a fashion which um, it doesn't, you know, you're not entering and then finding that, uh, you know, the value of the company drops 20% over the following few months, right? So I'm not exactly saying that you need to dollar cost average, but you do need to be aware of valuations, entry points, and, and other financial analysis, uh, which would point to, you know, maybe, you know, the, the share price going down for a while. Um, so... I'm a big favor of uh, a big fan of uh, fundamentals, um, but you do need to do your homework. So that to me would would point to say a portfolio, a fairly concentrated portfolio of companies that you like that are very well structured um, uh, of maybe 10 stocks. That's how I would manage my, my, my own uh, 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 risks. I think beyond that, um, you know, Buying ETFs, etc. I think you know those are, are fine if you if you need to hedge uh, or if you want to take a, a position and you don't have the time to go and find those fundamentals. But I think we should all have a list of stocks that we like, right? And that's how I think that's the best way to manage risk over the long term. Okay, thanks, Bertram. Yeah, no, uh, definitely. Um, Jeremy, do you have any thoughts on that? How, how, yeah. how do you they manage risk, I guess, in your in your, in your investment uh, investment sure. outlook. So maybe I will just cover more from the cyclical perspective in terms of uh, looking at some signs to determine where we can mm. actually step into a bear market. I think the clearest indication or the easiest one to watch is actually looking at the U spread. Uh, maybe looking at the two ten spread in terms of uh, the US U curve. I think that is the biggest giveaway in terms of telling us uh, exactly uh, when a recession is going to come. And usually be, during periods of recession, that is when we actually see that kind of a volatile sell-off ranging more than 35% or more. So I think for investors, once we start to see headlines coming out uh, from news media saying that the inversion of the U curve is here, that the 210 spread uh, actually falls down below to the negative territory, I think those periods will be the time to actually start to uh, look to lighten up your equity exposure and sink into something that is uh, of a risk adverse kind of asset class. So I think that is more on the timing side of things. And usually when that happens, it only would uh, play through during periods uh, after we see a few rate hikes coming in from the Federal Reserve. So with that in mind, uh, usually if you were to look back in history, uh, it usually takes around maybe five to six rate hikes before we see the U curve actually inverts. And looking at what the Fed actually tells us, uh, the interest rate is only going to rise or start to actually increase uh, 2023 or later. So with that in mind, I think this bull market still has further room to grow until we see uh, the Fed funds rate probably rising up to say 1.5% or so uh, before there is this fear of slipping into a bear market. So that is on the timing side of things. But I guess for those investors that don't really have much time to do their homework, uh, studying individual financials, fundamental analysis, I think the easiest way to get an exposure is for instance, just to get into an S&P 500 index ETF, the SPY. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you were to look back in terms of the historical performance, you are looking at an annualized return of, say, a ranging from around 7 to 9% per annum. So I think it's yeah. definitely still better than parking your money in the bank and just yeah. having an exposure within the equity markets being in SPY, I think still does make some sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I guess we are coming up to the last question. I think this one 
we can address to our ESG guru, um, Bertram. I think you can take this one first, but I guess Sabun and Jeremy, if you want to chime in, you can you can also uh, have any thoughts on, but let me just share this uh, last question that we have for tonight. Okay, so Bertram, are there any opportunities or plays to be made from climate catastrophes? Uh, I guess this would be sort of in the wildfires or earthquakes or climate change. Um, that would net a positive ESG impact as well. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the question in terms of climate catastrophes, in terms of... Uh, uh, I think they were talking about wildfires or, um, or, or earthquakes, I guess. I guess, I think from my understanding, it's like, is there anything... Hmm. Is there an investment angle to it? I guess in, you know, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of talk of um, sort of catastrophe bonds and like other, other areas like that. I don't know if this, that, that's how I kind of viewed the question. Is there an opportunity within all this craziness in terms of ESG? But I, I assume that would be, be yeah. ESG plays, right? That's, that's a great question. Um, I think that's going to be a really obscure alternative part of the market um if they were yeah. um i this question is interesting i will go away and try to find some um, <laughs> um uh, instruments that could benefit from that i mean i i, I mean i again I, I would say esg is all about um you know, two things one is identifying uh, risks and opportunities so uh, at least be aware of the risks for the investments that you're going into and then, of course, there are a whole heap of new opportunities that are being created by, by regulation and by, um, uh, I guess, the, the change in business models that we're seeing. So uh, around the catastrophes themselves, um, you know, you know I, I, I think, no, I, I would say no at this stage. But if, if we can find out who asked that question, I will definitely get back to you um, if, if I can find something. Um, sounds like it's some some form of insurance, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think the, the only other area I would say, which is not really open to to invest, uh, sorry, retail investors at this this stage, uh, would be things like green bonds, um, etc., where you are you're you're, you're getting paid a, a, a higher interest rate if the company doesn't perform. Um, according to its commitments, but you know that's that's not quite the same as climate catastrophe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Say, Boone, Jeremy, like, uh, I guess anything to add on that, or before we yeah, wrap up? Well, um, yeah. Well, uh, ESG is broader than just uh, a prevention of catastrophe. It includes good governance of companies. It's all about a better way of doing things. Yeah. It's all yeah. about a better way of doing things. And I'm not sure if you can trade a better way of doing things. Yeah? Uh, yeah. The, the best way you can invest uh, uh, in a more sustainable, a better governed world is to buy into companies with good ESG scoring, right? So companies all over the world, boardrooms all over the world are working on improving their ESG scores, which is for the better of the world. So that said, uh, catastrophe. So uh, catastrophe bonds are just a bit sort of arcane and a little bit out, well, not a little bit, very much outside the purview of the ordinary investor, right? So, uh, and, and carbon credits, are also sort of outside the purview, uh, the, 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 what's the word for it? The uh, availability for the ordinary investor. So um, no, I, I just can't see how you can trade that sensibly, all right? Yeah. Yeah. Unless yeah. you wanted to short insurance companies for catastrophes, not a good idea, right? Okay, all right. All right. Um, I think we've come to the end of our um, of our discussion tonight. So I'd like to thank all the speakers. I think before we go and before we say bye, I just want to um, kind of share with everybody on the on the webinar tonight. Obviously, a, a refresh of the campaign. Um, you know, scan here to register, and and you can 
you know, potentially win a Tesla Model 3 as well as uh, monthly Apple products. Uh, you know, Bertram was mentioning Apple. They got great stuff, very easy to use, um, you know, uh, very good UI UX. It's a great product. So if you are into Apple or to Tesla, um, you know, scan here and have a chance to win some, some of these great, these great products. Uh, also follow our socials for updates on Facebook, Insta, or, or LinkedIn over here. Uh, obviously Twitter and YouTube as well. And then finally, um, if you are hungry for more vouchers, be sure to register for our next webinar. We've been doing a driven to learn webinar that started uh, you know, a couple of months ago. And we've got a whole series of webinars tonight included as well. So if you want to sign up for future webinars or if you really enjoyed uh, tonight's webinar, then please do hop on across to the, to the site and sign up for, um, for future webinars as well. So I think that does it for us. It's been a pretty good long hour, hour and a 15 minute discussion. So kind of want to thank all our guests tonight. So thank you, uh, Bertram. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Seibun, for, for joining us. I had a really uh, good chat about everything from China to the US to ESG. Uh, and hopefully we can do it again in future. So without further ado, I guess I'll, uh, I'll sign off and say good night to everybody. Thank you.